I'm Holly Page with No Labels Talks here with my co-worker, friend, and a co-podcaster, at least for the introduction part, Ryan Clancy. How are you doing, Ryan? Good. How are you doing, Holly? It's been a crazy week. Yep. Tonight's final day of the Republican convention. Um, it's been, this has really been, I mean, such an unusual convention in so many ways, but it really is unlike any Republican convention we've seen in our lifetimes. I agree. When uh, the head of the Teamsters spoke, uh, you know, I that was, I think, a really uh, stunning moment uh, in terms of the, you know, realignment that's happening within our politics. Obviously, he did not endorse Donald Trump, but the very fact that he was there after Joe Biden uh, was the first American president to ever walk a picket line, that is pretty significant. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it has been a um, notably more diverse convention, um, but both in terms of the, you know, uh, gender, race and religion of the speakers, but also just the perspectives, um, you know, the the Republican platform itself is very different from the um, platform we've seen in previous years. Very different language on abortion and gay marriage. Um, uh, a total absence of language on the debt and deficits, uh, and 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 obviously, um, pretty strident language on on immigration and border security, and um, you know, reflecting a a the emerging consensus among many Republicans um, for a different kind of foreign policy, too. Absolutely. I think they're I think they're doing a commendable job, actually, talking to the voters that they are hoping to win over people for whom housing and groceries uh, are too expensive. Yeah. And, you know, not that they, in my opinion, anyway, have a lot of solutions to that. But I think the first, you know, most important thing to win a campaign is for people to feel like you understand what is uh, what they're facing in their daily lives. And I think they're doing that effectively. And I hope the Democrats are paying attention. Well, we're going to see tonight, obviously, uh, former President Trump is speaking. Um, he, has, he has notably promised. He said um, he ripped up the original speech he was going to give that he wrote um, before the assassination attempt. He said it was a humdinger, which I think we can read as it was just going to be a lot of red meat attacking Biden and Democrats. And um, so he has he has promised um, a very different kind of speech that we've come to expect with him. We're going to see if, uh, you know, he, he delivers on that. And, you know, as you and I know, because we both uh, bear the battle scars, it's one thing to talk about unity, to talk about working together. It's quite another to actually do it and to do it committed to the things that No Labels wants to see, which is the stewardship of the nation and our peace and prosperity. And so while I hope that indeed he has had a, uh, a revelation, if you will, um, about his you know, language in the past and how divisive it is, I do think that it's important for the No Labels community to really understand that, you know, we're not, we, we're not for unity for unity's sake or bipartisanship just to have bipartisanship. It really is the means to the end. And the end is, yes. is the long-term things that are in the best interest of our, of our nation. Yeah. We look, we've unfortunately seen this pattern before in our politics where there's some kind of tragedy. And for a couple days, Everybody kind of says and does the right things and suggests, well, gee, we need to tone it down and turn the temperature. And then, you know, a week later, we're back to uh, exactly where we were. And, um, you know, hopefully that is not the pattern this time. It certainly has been the pattern in the past. Um, look, we're, we're pretty lucky um, in terms of our guest this week, um, somebody we've known for a long time, Charlie Black. Um, who not only he was a co-founder of No Labels, so he knows our movement really well, but um, was basically involved in every major Republican presidential campaign uh, from uh, Ronald Reagan up until um, John McCain. And, uh, and I, I, did, I don't know if he worked on the Romney campaign, actually. No, either. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he's going to he's going to talk us through um, not only what he thinks of the convention and um, the uh, 
the the prospects for former President Trump in the months ahead, but what he thinks of President Biden's situation. And I and I think people find he's he's got a surprising take on uh on, on where he thinks it's gonna go from here. So I would encourage people um to to listen to the whole thing, to to hear how Charlie thinks this race is gonna evolve. So everybody enjoy No Labels Talks this week with Charlie Black. Hey there, this is Ryan Clancy here for another edition of uh, No Labels Talks. And this week, uh, we are talking to um, exactly the person we need to be talking to, given the fact that the Republicans are in the midst of their convention, uh, Charlie Black. Charlie is a veteran of many Republican presidential campaigns, Reagan, both Bush campaigns, the McCain campaign, uh, where he operated um, at the most senior levels. Um, and, and he also is the founding chair of Prime Policy Group, which is one of the most respected public affairs firms in DC. So we, we brought Charlie on to talk about his thinking on the convention and, and where the race goes from here. Uh, Charlie, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. So Charlie, I know you had a, a couple opening thoughts you wanted to share, and then we're gonna um, get into some questions. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll make just a few comments about where I see the presidential race today um, and uh, then look forward to discussion. Um, so my credential that Ryan didn't lay out there is I am a member of the board, the legal board of No Labels. So for those of you who don't know me, I have been working with No Labels for a long time and I'm in the category in this presidential race of likes neither. Um, I did not support Trump and will not support him in the general election. So we, you need that for context. But uh, here's where the race is. Uh, since the debate <clears throat> on June 27th, which everybody has heard the term disaster for Joe Biden, um, Trump has gained a, a small but significant lead. But then things changed even more um, this past Saturday after the assassination attempt. Uh, Donald Trump was, was given a gift. Uh, a lot of us think it was a gift from God that he survived with only a minor injury, but also it, the opportunity to stand and show courage and show fight under attack like that has lifted him politically in a significant way. It's also uh, lucky that that's going right into the convention where he gets a chance to showcase himself, his vice presidential running mate and his other allies. Now, since um, I, I think the national polls that we all look at, most of us on a daily basis, um, I think you have to look at them starting last Saturday now. I think that changed a lot of things. And since Saturday, the reliable polls are, are giving Trump a three-point average lead in the national popular vote. Remember the significance of that. Republicans don't usually win the national popular vote. If a Republican wins the popular vote, then they win big by significant margins in most, if not all, the swing states. So Trump's up about three nationally, but right now, uh, the analysis that matters is, how do you get to 270 electoral votes? Well, you assume that Trump can win all the states he carried in 2020 in a losing race. And right now he's got a, a lead in, in all of those. But then if you added to that, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. That would put him over 270. And right now, Trump has a five to seven point lead in all four of those states. He has a small lead in some of the other swing states like Michigan and Wisconsin. But so as of today, I, it's, uh, I, I think it's fair to say Trump has a commanding lead. In the meantime, Joe Biden is has been has he's been in political decline since the June twenty seventh debate, and the whole subject about him has been should he drop out of the race? Big divisions in his own party. 
about whether he should continue. And they're still ongoing. Uh, I'm inclined to think he won't drop out, but um, that remains to be seen. If he did drop out, despite all the speculation, Vice President Harris would be the Democratic nominee uh, because of the time constraint on anyone else getting in and organizing the campaign, but also the African-American leaders in the Democratic Party have pretty much laid down the gauntlet. You know, Biden, we're with you, but if you do get out, it has to be Harris. So uh, a Trump race against Harris, uh, as of today, might be a little bit harder than running against Biden, but I don't think it's that much harder. She still has to defend the record of the administration on all the issues. And frankly, she if, is well left of Biden in her career on issues in the U.S. Senate. So I, I put Trump in a commanding position either way. The National Convention so far, I think content-wise, has been bad for Trump. Uh, part of the gift he was given is the opportunity to try to be more positive and unify the country and and if you want to call it move to the middle, move to the middle. But you knew if you were watching this that one of the first speakers at the convention was Marjorie Taylor Greene. It didn't look like the convention was trying to send that message. By the way, I promise you every single speaker, everything that happens at that convention is approved by Donald Trump. He is a TV guru and, and thinks he is and frankly he is, so he knew some of these things would send a bad signal to the swing voters. So, but in addition to that, you know, you've had uh, Peter Navarro, if anybody watched him last night, when you have a major speaker walk straight out of jail and onto the stage, you, you know, you gotta be skeptical, but he, he went back to the old theme of the, the justice department and the whole justice system is rigged and we're martyrs and persecuted for our political views. The other thing I looked at, uh, not every voter would notice this, but in the president's box, as he has come onto the floor each night and sat in his box, the guests in his box have included Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Lauren Boebert. Um, he's dragging in all of the extreme elements in the Republican Party from Congress, people who aren't even respected by most other Republican congressmen. So why they're doing that, I don't know, but the messaging so far is not good for him. That said, with any convention, about 80% of the political impact is the acceptance speech of the nominee. So that's coming up tonight. Trump still has a good opportunity. And what we got to see is, will his message indeed be unity? Not Republican unity, but national unity. Uh, will he talk about policy and will he, will he talk about substance or just make personal attacks on Joe Biden? Um, and how much whining and complaining will he do uh, as he is wont to do about the last election being stolen and him being persecuted unfairly and so forth? It's a great opportunity to make a relatively positive speech. We'll just see if he does it. Uh, if he did do that, it would help him come out of this convention with an even more commanding lead. Last comment, uh, the voters in the race who don't like either candidate, uh, which is a lot, uh, that was no label's whole purpose with our insurance policy was to provide a third choice. They're still gonna be the key to who wins the race. Uh, and, and the political position Joe Biden's in right now, you would think his turnout will be a challenge. Um, and on the other hand, Trump, because of recent events, seems to have galvanized his base. Republicans would be more likely to turn out. There's a lot of people in the middle who don't like either one of them. And Biden's not out of it. He's just got a long way to go. So thanks, Charlie, um, for those opening thoughts. I, there's a couple of questions I have for you, and then we're going to open it up to our audience. One thing I want to start with is there's been a lot of discussion about the platform. Uh, and mm -hmm. you, Charlie, in your career have been part of the creation of a lot of platforms 
over the years. And the platform that was agreed to at this convention is really notably different from previous Republican platforms. Uh, if, if you look at the language on abortion and gay marriage, for example, it's what I think some would describe as softer and vaguer than previous mm -hmm. Republican platforms. Um, uh, on the other hand, you have basically no mention of debt deficits, the budget, just some kind of broad uh, talk about wasteful <clears throat> government spending. Um, I want to get your sense of, of what you think of this platform and how meaningful you think it is. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's always a debate about whether these platforms actually mean something or whether they're just something that people put out there and then they forget about them as, as soon as they come out. Do you think this really meaningfully represents a permanent, if not permanent, then, then durable shift in what the Republican Party stands for? I, I think it might. Um, again, this platform was, you know, Trump probably didn't write it, but he certainly edited it and approved every word of it. Now, I, I think it's good for the party to soften their position on abortion and gay rights. That is reality in this country, and it's smart for most Republicans to recognize it. We used to produce a 90 to 100 page platform with a lot of details on issues. And the Republican Party, the, the delegates, the grassroots around the country really care about the platform. It has significance only in that regard because voters are gonna to listen to what the nominee says, not what's in the platform. But the rest of this platform, and they're shortening it down to 16 pages and they didn't acknowledge the biggest problem facing the country long term, which is our deficit and our, our spending habits, which is unusual for a Republican platform. But it also is, is like an ode to Trump, you know, especially on foreign policy and isolationism. All of his key points are in there. Uh, remember this, Trump has only been a Republican for about 10 to 15 years, and he was pro-choice and pro-gay rights before that. So He's never been comfortable with the positions he espoused on social issues. And now he's moved, they're moving it back closer to where he is. So as you noted, Charlie, um, the, the president, former president's speeches tonight, we'll all see um, whether in fact, you, you all saw reported over the weekend. Um, he said he tore up the initial speech he'd written before the assassination attempt. And he said he's gonna give a very different speech. So we'll see if that's the case. I want to turn though to um, President Biden um, and uh, obviously the move, which is growing to get him off the ticket. And you said, if it's not him, um, you, you said you, you think it would almost certainly be Harris. The question is, um, how is it that that would happen? Because they have the convention at the end of uh, next month. Is, is your thought that President Biden would very likely endorse her on the way out, kind of making yeah. that a fait accompli? Okay. Yes. I mean, what I expect, and I still would, would bet that he stays in, but if he decides to get out uh, on the eve of the convention or even the first day of the convention, he could say he could announce, you know what, I do have a health problem. I'm not going to run. You, my delegates, are released, and I ask you to support Vice President Kamala Harris. And most people would come in line readily, especially because the most loyal constituency in the Democratic Party, African-Americans, or their leaders are sort of demanding it. Plus, it's a lot simpler in terms of the infrastructure of the campaign, the, her ability to spend the same money that's in the Biden-Harris account. Um, the other thing is, think about it. If, if you were Gavin Newsom or Gretchen Whitmer or a potential future Democratic nominee, why would you want to get in now? Uh, not having organized a campaign, organized a staff or policy people, and very likely to lose to Donald Trump. I mean, that's the supreme insult in the Democratic Party. If you lost to Donald Trump, you'd never get the nomination. Well, Charlie, before I, I want to open it up to our audience, but I have one final question, which is um, you're saying even with all we've read about and heard about in the last couple of days, that you, you think Biden is going to stay in. Um, today, if you just look at news that has come across the transom this morning, we, we learned the following. Number one, it, it's being reported that um, 
Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Hakeem Jeffries are now directly communicating to the president behind the scenes that they think his uh, candidacy is a threat to the party down ballot. Um, Joe Scarborough, uh, host of Morning Joe, who has been probably the most stalwart defender of President Biden, called on him to get out this morning. There was also some reporting, who knows if this is true, but um, that uh, internally within the White House, Harris staffers are now directly telling Biden uh, advisors, it's time for you all to pass the baton and get out. So given all these forces that are aligning to push President Biden off the ticket, why do you think he's still ultimately going to be the nominee? Well, I, I think you have seen the stubbornness he has shown uh, for the last three weeks since the debate. Uh, and, you know, some people speculate, well, they're not showing him the real poll numbers. He can read. He knows he knows what the what the poll numbers are. He just has faith in his own personal ability to de defeat Trump and in his own ability to do the job. So. Pelosi has been orchestrating behind the scenes since June 27th, since the debate, to get Biden out. The problem is there's only one vote in this question, and it's Joe Biden. Up to now, his family has not wanted him to get out. In fact, for the last two weeks, Hunter Biden has been in the White House full time and almost acting as chief of staff to prevent people who might get him out of the race from meeting with him, going into meetings and, and you know, being a cheerleader for staying in the race. I'm not going to speculate on Hunter's motivations. We know what some of them have been in the past. But um, the only people who might convince him to get out would be his family. I don't see that yet. Um. I want to open it up for some questions, and if you could just say your name and and where you're from. I'm um, starting with um, Andrew Tish. Andrew, you you got a question for Charlie? Thanks, Ryan. Uh, how are you, Charlie? Uh, good, Andrew. How you doing? Good. That's that's not my question. Uh, <laughs> how um how do you see each house uh, faring with Biden as the candidate and without Biden as the can candidate? I, I think right now. Um, this race is Donald Trump's to lose. And if he does do a good job of being moderate and tolerant in his remarks tonight and, and for the rest of the campaign, uh, you're probably going to see a good Republican result in both the House and the Senate. Now, Trump can always screw this up. In fact, he probably will do and say some controversial things between now and election day. But if I, the only thing I would uh, suggest, Andrew, is Biden right now has a dispirited base and maybe a turnout problem. Harris might uh, reinvigorate the base and, and give them a better turnout. But if, if Donald Trump were to win the popular vote, even by one vote. That means he's winning most of these states that have competitive House and Senate races by a good margin. And it does make a difference. So I, I you know, as of today, I think um, Republicans will probably get the Senate and keep the House. Jack, you have a question. Uh, Jack Moss from South Florida. Uh, Charlie and I go back to the 70s and 80s and Florida trying to get some Republicans elected before either of us had gray hair. That's right, great to see you, Jack. My question is, uh, what do we need to do to make the best of a possible bad situation? What can no labels do if there's a Republican in the executive and the House and the Senate are Republican to move the administration more toward the center than drifting toward further right? Uh, Jack, I believe that's where the Problem Solvers Caucus and their Senate allies come in. Um, I'll give you one example. We've talked about the deficit. Now, Trump wants to go uh, renew all the so-called Trump tax cuts, most of which expire next year. Um, but there are some Republicans who think we shouldn't do that without some spending reduction or maybe modify the amount of tax cuts that we that we provide. 
So I, I think I do not think he would have the ability to use the reconciliation process to get his tax cuts done again with just Republicans. So I think it's going to be a big negotiation, hopefully a bipartisan negotiation about some deficit reduction. Uh, if some tax cuts are extended, maybe some others have to be raised a little bit. But that's why our strength uh, you know, on things like the infrastructure bill and knocking out the $5 trillion that Biden wanted for Inflation Reduction Act, so-called. We've had influence that way already, and we can do more, and we should do more. And I also think that um, Trump intimidates a lot of Republicans politically. He'll be a lame duck if he gets back in there, and um, I think more people might be willing to stand up to him. Uh, so we got to flex our muscles uh, as centrists. We're not really moderates. We have some conservatives, some progressives, and no labels, and in our caucuses. But we'll have to flex our muscles. I think one thing I'd add too, if you look at the Senate, is you know we really want to get behind those senators that are willing to preserve the filibuster. You know, the mm -hmm. filibuster is one of the last procedural tools available that forces Democrats and Republicans to work together and uh, prevents the majority party from just trying to jam through really seismic changes uh, with only 51 votes. So uh, we're gonna definitely be engaged on that issue. Um, most of the conversation naturally is about the presidential choice, which as far as I can tell, most people on this, on this Zoom view is a choice of between bad and worse, whichever way they lean. So I'm kind of more interested in the congressional prospects. A couple of weeks ago, uh, a Bowman lost in the primary, a um, squad member and a um, progressive caucus member, and three Trump-endorsed um, nominees also lost. And uh, Ryan, you know this better than I would, but I think that's kind of unprecedented. So... Does that suggest that there really is a chance for more centrist um, candidates in that arena? And if so, is there some kind of more organized push that we could have in support of those people? Ryan. Um, well, the the race that um, that Owen's mentioning um, uh, Jamal Bowman's race in New York. He he was a squad member. He lost his primary against a guy named George Latimer. Uh, down in Virginia, the chairman of the Freedom Caucus, Bob Good, uh, appears to have lost his primary, though he is um, was trying to challenge the results. Uh, look, th those to us are promising lead indicators. Uh, it, it suggests that um, if given a viable choice, there are a lot of voters that want something better than what they're getting um, from the extremes. That's part of the reason why we do see an opening next cycle in 25 and 26. Some of you've heard us talk about this strategy in, 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 our, in our other briefings that um, we'd like to engage in some races where, where we go out and recruit candidates um, that we think can run and, and maybe defeat um, some of these extreme members of Congress. Charlie, I don't know if you have anything add to that yeah that's right this is a good leading indicator and and what it tells you is that the quality of the candidates matters uh the people who upset extremists in primaries were good candidates who had an appeal to the mainstream and uh so we will be active no labels will be active in trying to recruit or encourage good quality candidates to take on everybody from marjorie taylor green to Ilhan Omar, in some states, you're going to have to do it in primaries, and others, an independent, might be able to win in a three-way race. But uh, we're encouraged, at least uh, initially, by some of these primary results. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody else. Thanks, everybody. No Labels Talks, and we'll, we'll see you again next week. Thank you.